Today, as we continue our series, Stories of Sinful Saints, uh, this is going to be kind of the last week of new saints that you maybe haven't heard of or aren't familiar with. Uh, there are two weeks left of this series, but after this week, there, there are people that you've heard of. And today, you actually are going to get a two-for-one, as the saints that we are talking about today are Albrecht Dewar and Lucas Cronach. Cronach and Dewar were 16th century Christian artists. Uh, and you may have actually seen some of their art and didn't even realize it. So these men lived in Germany in the early 1500s. Can you think of anybody else that lived in Germany in the early 1500s? Luther, yeah. And these guys were actually friends of Luther. Uh, and specifically for Cronach, Cronach actually included Luther in some of his art. I guess he was like besties with Luther more than Dewar was. These first two paintings are uh, two of Cronach's paintings. The one on the right is probably one of the best known paintings we have of Luther. <clears throat> and the one on the left is uh, actually used on the cover of several like theology books that are used in seminary. And uh, the, this is just a portion of the picture, but if you were to spread it out, um, on the right side is Luther in a pulpit, and on the left side is a congregation. And so it's showing that Luther is preaching Christ to the people. These next two uh, pieces are of doers. Uh, the first one on the left depicts the crucified Christ risen into the glories of heaven, and then on the right is a realism drawing of Jesus. Now these men expanded the gospel in ways that really had never been experienced. They helped portray the gospel in a way that hadn't been done before. Uh, I love this quote from the book that we've kind of been using as the baseline for this series. Uh, the book is Celebrating the Saints, and this is the quote. Furthermore, the gospel is such a means of grace in every form which it reaches man, whether it's preached or printed or expressed as a formal absolution or pictured in types and symbols or pondered in the heart. So in other words, forgiveness, the gospel, is found in more than just the words of Scripture in whatever way it is experienced. And so today, and maybe you never thought you'd hear your pastor say this, we're going to talk about art. And I'm not just talking about, like, paintings, but also music and movies as well. And I'm really excited to get to preach on this because this is a really important topic, but it's one that doesn't really fit in the traditional Lutheran sermon. And so, given the opportunity, I took it. And I'm also excited because... I think there are examples, uh, opportunities to see the gospel pretty much everywhere we look. We just don't always know what to look for. Now, as we begin, I want to kind of set some clear parameters for where I'm trying to take us today, because uh, it's, this can easily become something that it's not meant to be. We're going to be talking about the gospel that is experienced in media, in, in art, this is not going to be, oh, well, I experience God out on the golf course more than in church. This is not, I experience God in nature more than I experience him in the Bible. What I want to help to show is that there are glimpses of the gospel, glimpses of our nature as humans, glimpses of the truths of God's word in a lot of different places. There's so much in art, music, movies that reflect truth that we cling to as Christians. And when we realize that, we can, when we realize that, we can see it uh, in things we experience on a daily basis, and they can further point us to the truth of God's Word. These things help us to see the truth of God's Word. It, it doesn't replace it. Our foundation is on Scripture. And with all these examples that I'm going to share, I'm one person. I'm, I'm sharing my perspective. So you could look at a piece of art and see something completely different. And that's great. 
right? God has given us each different life experiences, different perspectives, and we're just going to see things differently. You know, the gospel hits us differently, but that's a good thing. We have our own perspective. I've said enough already, so let's just look at some examples, and you'll see what I mean. We're going we're gonna to start with art. Do we have any art experts in here? The, the one who gives tours at the art museum is being humble and is not raising his hand. <laughs> I'm not an art expert myself, but I do appreciate getting to look at art and, and just getting a glimpse of seeing what the artist intended. But we're going to start with uh, a few that are, are explicitly Christian. And the first one, maybe you're familiar with. It is our stained glass windows um, in, in the sanctuary. Stained glass windows are a great example of seeing truths of God's word in art. I love going to different churches and getting to see different stained glass windows, uh, seeing different aspects of the beauty of God's word. I don't know about you, but my eyes immediately go to the lamb. The lamb is on the right side about halfway up. The lamb that is bleeding into a cup. This can make you think of a, a few things. The first thing makes me think of is the Passover, right? Old Testament, the people of Israel are about to be delivered from the Egyptians, and they are to sacrifice the lamb and paint its blood on the doorpost. And the angel of death will pass over them, and they will be spared. Jesus is our Passover lamb, who was slain for us so that we are spared from death. And you see, he is pouring into a cup. It's a connection to communion, where in communion, we drink the blood of the Lamb. If you want to learn more about our stained glass windows, by the way, uh, talk to one of us pastors. We actually have like a little brochure kind of thing that walks through each, and in, uh, each part of that stained glass. The next thing I want to talk about is this mosaic of a, a pelican family. This is an old Lutheran symbol and is actually a, a symbol based on what happens in real life. So if there's a family of pelicans that is facing starvation, the mother will pick at its own flesh, opening itself up so that its children can eat and live. Gross, I'll contend. Uh, it's definitely gross. But is that not just so powerful? Jesus gave his life for us. And again, in communion, we eat the very blood and uh, eat the very body and drink the very blood of Jesus. What a powerful depiction of the gospel. Now I want to turn our attention to this uh, picture of an underwater sculpture. Now, to my knowledge, this is not intended to be Christian, uh, explicitly Christian, but uh, the, when I look at this, the first thing that I think of is like what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 4, where he says, though we are outwardly wasting away, Yet inwardly, we are being renewed daily. This sculpture is, is corroding, right? It's corroding, it's entangled in seaweed, but it's looking up. It's like he's being renewed by God, though the outward parts are corroding. I also think of Paul in Colossians 3, where he says, Set your minds on things that are above, not things that are on earth. I want to next turn our attention to movies. So my father-in-law, who's also a pastor, has a saying about a good movie. He says a good movie will in some way portray the gospel. It'll have some aspect of redemption, of sacrifice, of forgiveness, of restoration somewhere in it. This goes beyond just movies, but a good story in general. Now, with these movies I'm going over, I hope no one was like, Pastor, I was going to watch this this afternoon. Thanks for spoiling it. Hope that's not the case. Uh, the first one I want to go to is one that I'm sure, especially parents with younger kids have seen. Maybe, well, if you've seen it once as a parent of a younger kid, let's be real, you've probably seen it like five times at least. Encanto. And yes, we are going to talk about Bruno. Bruno is ultimately, uh, he's kind of, he's, he's the uncle in the main family, and he is rejected and ultimately leaves his family. 
We later find out that he does this to protect his family, specifically his niece, Mirabel. And, and we also find out that though he has left his family, he's never far off. He's, he's very close by watching over them and caring for them. Not only was Jesus rejected by his own people that he came to save, but he knowingly and willingly allowed it to happen, just like Bruno. And Jesus is never far from us. He is always with us, protecting us and, and caring for us and intervening with the Father. Who would have thought we would have seen a glimpse of the gospel from a Disney movie, right? Next example, I want to take us to a galaxy far, far away with the newest Star Wars trilogy, which, by the way, newest Star Wars trilogy, eh, not the biggest fan. It's got some good stuff, but it's thumb half, halfway up. Kylo Ren, this guy up here, is the main villain uh, in these movies. And the very first movie, he kills his own father, Han Solo. And he, he just, he wants to commit to being an evil Sith. But throughout the three movies, and specifically in the last one, he, he can't help but feel this stirring inside that something is not right. He has this call inside from the light side of the Force. And in the end, he gives up his evil ways. He, he turns to the light side. He becomes good. And in fact, he actually gives his own life to save Rey, the main character. He goes from being the big baddie of the movies, killing his own family, hunting down the main characters of the movie, to becoming good. Does that remind you of anybody in the Bible? His life is very close to the Apostle Paul. Paul started out zealously persecuting the church, hunting down Christians, Christians who, by the way, were his own people, Jews. And, and he felt this stirring inside him, calling him to Christianity. And, and when he was converted, he was made new. His past was no longer what to find him, but in Christ he was made new. The last movie I want to look at is Batman, The Dark Knight. And at the end of the movie, Batman is about to uh, uh, take the punishment for a crime that he did not commit in order to protect the people of Gotham City. And there's an amazing dialogue between him and police, uh, police commissioner Gordon, and this is just a little bit from it. Batman says, they'll hunt me down, condemn me, send the dogs on me, because that's what needs to happen. And as Batman leaves, Commissioner Gordon's son says, Why is he running, Dad? He didn't do anything wrong. And Gordon says, Because he's the hero Gotham deserves, but not the one it needs right now. So we'll hunt him down because he can take it. Jesus paid for crimes that he didn't commit. He was hated and hunted for doing nothing wrong. And it's not fair. He didn't do anything wrong but he was the hero the world needed. Now, both in, in Bruno and in Batman, where we see aspects of the main characters uh, symbolizing Christ, it's not to say that throughout the whole movie, everything they do represents Christ, but we just see glimpses of them in the movies. Lastly, I want to talk about music. Music is a very powerful thing. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of listening to Christian music, but even when we don't listen to Christian music, we can still see Jesus. The first song I want to discuss is Ain't No Mountain High Enough by Marvin Gaye. I bet if somebody were to start us off, we'd all be belting it, right? I'm not going to do that. Anybody else want to take that? Yeah, I didn't think so. Let's just look at the chorus. Because baby, there ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no river wide enough to keep me from getting to you, baby. Now, these words are obviously intended for a significant other, but they apply in thinking about Christ's relationship to us. Think Romans 8, where Paul says, For I am convinced neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, nor power, neither, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will we be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? 
Jesus moved heaven and earth to get to us. He didn't let anything keep us apart. Not our sin, not the best efforts of the devil, not even death itself. There is nothing, not a single thing that can keep us from Jesus. Next song I want to look at is Won't Back Down by Tom Petty. And this, I just got to say, this feels like it should be a Christian song. Uh, in fact, when I was in high school, I went to a Mercy Me concert, and they sang this song. So I felt very validated. I was not the only one who thought that. Uh, some of the opening lyrics are, No, I won't back down. You could stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. No, I'll stand my ground, won't be turned around, and I'll keep this world from dragging me down. I'm going to stand my ground, and I won't back down. Mr. Petty, Mr. Petty had a pretty good theological perspective there. And this actually lines up with uh, the message that we've seen several times in this series so far, as recently as with Lawrence. You could stand us up at the gates of hell, and we're not going to back down, because in Christ we win. In Christ we stand our ground. In Christ we are kept from being dragged down by the world and all its might. This last song I want to look at uh, is, gonna, is from the musical Hamilton, uh, which is in uh, movie form on Disney+. Plus. And Hamilton is a historical uh, depiction of Alexander Hamilton, one of the key figures in early U.S. history. During the musical, uh, Hamilton has an affair on his wife, and it is, it is very messy, very public, drags his, <clears throat> drags his family's name through the mud. And towards the end of the movie, there's this song called As Quiet Uptown. Towards the end of the song, here's a, here's a few of the lines. They are standing in the garden, Alexander by Eliza's side. She takes his hand, as quiet uptown. Forgiveness, can you imagine? Forgiveness, can you imagine? <clears throat> If you see him in the street, talking by her side, have pity. They're going through the unimaginable. It would be pretty unimaginable, uh, unimaginable to forgive someone who has broken that marital covenant to remain faithful to you. Yet throughout Scripture, we see this kind of relationship depicted of, of God and his people, the church. And we have gone after others time and time and time again. We have broken that covenant vow to God. But Jesus has forgiven the unforgivable in us. Can you imagine such forgiveness? And, and you know, Jesus actually uses a parable where he talks about somebody acquiring a debt larger than the debt, uh, the national debt of Palestine at the time, and that debt being forgiven. Before God, we have surmised such a, a huge debt. But God has forgiven it, all, forgiven it all in Jesus. Can you imagine such forgiveness? There are many more examples that we could walk through in art, music, movies, and, and even other examples that I've probably not even thought about. But I hope you get the point. Even these things that are, are not inherently Christian can still reflect truths of, of our condition as humans, truths of God's word, truths of the gospel. Now, we don't necessarily worship God through these things, and these things don't play, take the place of church, and they don't take the place of God's word. But we can see truths of God's word in our everyday lives through things like this. And you know why we can see the truths of God's word, the, the gospel, in all these things? Because everything, at its core at least, reflects the Creator. Everything reflects the Creator. Like what Paul says in our reading from Philippians 4, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise, those things all are aspects of God. They're truths of God's Word that we can see in our daily lives and take in. And again, I just want to make sure this is clear. These things don't take the place of, of God's Word or, or being in church but they help to further the truths of God's word. 
You know, in these examples that I gave, you know, most of them weren't even Christian. Well, if you listen to Christian music, watch Christian movies, read Christian books, the gospel is going to be even more in your face. Now, I do also feel it necessary to say that sometimes there are forms of media that are just not good for us to consume, right? Even if it, con- even if it does contain the gospel. If there's a movie that has just gratuitous sex, language, and violence, but has some gospel, that doesn't just mean that we should watch it because there's some good in it, right? On the flip side, if there's a movie that has some bad things, that doesn't mean it's automatically we shouldn't watch it. All this is to say that it's a larger process that we as Christians need to walk through, discerning what is good for us to consume, finding that balance. But ultimately, we can see truths of God's word in in many different ways. We can experience and be reminded of the gospel, the good news, the the hope and uh, restoration through Jesus in a large number of ways. And we, in large part, have people like Lucas Cronick, and Albrecht Dewar to think. They helped us to see God, the, the gospel goes beyond just reading in God's word, but can be experienced in a many number of ways. So as you go throughout your week, keep your eyes and ears open, trying to find these things in places that you might not expect, but you experience on a daily basis. And in two weeks, join us as we're going to be doing this together On Saturday, November 12th at 11 o'clock in here at the Activity Center, we're going to be watching Forrest Gump and and walking through this process. And wait for it, there's going to be food and childcare. So really, I mean, you have no excuse not to. Uh, There is information in your bulletin and uh, sign up online. Please consider doing this as this is really the first of what we hope is going to be a series where we walk through movies together and, and see God's word come through it. May God work through all the media, movies, TV that you encounter, and may he use it to point, to, to point and remind you of his crazy love for you. Amen. Lord God, we thank, you for, we thank you for your word where you tell us how much you love us. We also thank you for uh, different things, uh, art and music and movies and, and just different things that we take in, Lord, that also contain truth about who you are and your goodness towards us. Help us to, uh, as, we, as we walk through this world that has things that are not necessarily Christian, help us to see that you are in all things, that your love for us knows no bounds, and that uh, you can redeem even things that we might not think are redeemable. God, we ask that you would bless this process and bless your word. Amen. I invite you to stand as we continue with song.